Well, hello, church families. How are, is everybody doing today? Everybody doing good? I said, is everybody doing good today? <laughs> it's really good to see you. I am just honored to stand in front of you and uh, minister to you over the next few minutes as we uh, get into God's Word, and we are uh, going to continue our series. We're in week number three of a series called Let's Talk About It, and these are topics that you actually gave us on Easter Sunday when we did a survey, and we just collected them all, and we're taking the top five responses of requests from you uh, in this uh, message series, and I can't wait to get to it, but first let me look straight into the camera and say hello to all of our locations that are now joining us. We are one church in 26 different auditoriums across uh, Alabama and Georgia, and of course, I think you guys know this, we are bringing not only this service, but all that we are as a church, to, so between Sundays, uh, into more than 22 of Alabama's Department of Corrections facilities. They always go crazy, by the way, when we mention them. And I want to give you a chance to come on, show some love to everyone that's joining us. God bless you guys. Good job. And then, of course, we are streaming live right now, and uh, people watch on demand, and we're glad you're with us as well. I want to give a shout out down to the Auburn campus. I went uh, to the Auburn campus on Thursday night. The place was completely packed with college students going after God, and we had an amazing, amazing time, and I'm just so grateful uh, for what the Lord is doing. And I also want to give a shout out uh, to our Shoals campus. So we have a campus up in the uh, Muscle Shoals, Florence area, and I'm happy to report that this week we have broken ground on a new building for the, come on, the Shoals campus, all right. <laughs> And then we're actually next month uh, breaking ground uh, on a campus for Opelika. And if you're new to our church, uh, we start churches portably. And after five or six years or so, uh, we are able to build a building with cash. So when I say we broke ground, we already have all the money uh, that we need for both those buildings because of your generosity. Thank you so very much. And I'm actually meeting with our trustees uh, tonight who are our non-staff elders. Uh, and we're talking about uh, Oxford next and property in Columbus and property in Mobile. So you guys pray. And again, thank you for your amazing, amazing generosity that allows us to build houses of worship uh, all over our states. And then also, of course, the missions works that we do around the world. Today, we are going to talk a little bit about the topic of anxiety. That was your third most requested topic, uh, anxiety and depression. If you remember two weeks ago, I brought a message to you on stress and we really believe that those are two completely different things, and I address them differently. Stress is more about the external circumstances that happen to you that stress your life. One thing about external circumstances, you can't change those, so you can only enforce and reinforce your capacity to be able to handle bad days. And we talked about that. So that one's kind of nothing you can do about it, so sorry about that, but you can increase capacity to withstand the stresses of life. Today we're gonna to take the opposite approach, anxiety and depression. Uh, actually, circumstances could be going great and there's a war going on on the inside of your soul and of your emotions. I want you to look straight into my eye right here and I say this in the mighty name of Jesus. You do not have to live with that. That does not have to be a part of your life. You don't have to put up with it. There are real solutions in Jesus' name and God's people said a hey, good, Amen. it's true. It's very, very true. And today I stand before you, I think, with some moral authority to talk about this topic because I have experience of what I'm teaching you today. I wanna give you my story in the first part of this message. Um, for a lot of you, you already know this. If you've joined our church, I've actually tell this story in our membership class, which is week one of the growth track. But I was an associate pastor in Louisiana and I've always been, the half, the glass is not even half full, it's always full. I've never had a bad day in my life. I wake up happy literally every day, uh, but in 1999, had the worst year of my life, circumstantially, and it got into my soul. And by 2000, I'm a pretty miserable guy, but there was nothing on paper uh, that should have made me miserable. There was no external reasons anymore. In fact, uh, we were in our dream job, working at my home church, I was paid better than I would have paid me. You know, uh, we had a house we had just finished building. It was our first home. We put it out in the country. It was a small home, but it was ours. You know, it was our first home. We we're raising a family of five beautiful small children. And I think I'm just doing fine and dandy, but I'm miserable on the inside. And the problem with that particular instance is I didn't know why. And that was very, very frustrating to me because I'm a fix it kind of a guy. So if I'd have known what it was, I'd have done something about it. I didn't know. Everything on paper 
said I should have been the happiest guy alive. And I was just about to check myself into a clinic. I'd become convinced that it was chemical or biological, that there was something going on. And our church, like we do here at Highlands, always did 21 days of prayer and fasting to start the year. And, and so in January of, 20, of, of, the, of the year 2000, we were in this fast, and I really took it very, very seriously. I mean, I'd, I'd always fasted something, you know, like broccoli and cauliflower or something like that, you know. <laughs> but I, but I, I had gone all in with this fast because I was actually very desperate. And, um, and on the day 17, I had what's called an open vision. In other words, I saw really in my mind's eye, as clearly as I'm seeing it in my physical eyes right now, what I'm looking at right now. I saw this room this size and shaped just like it is with the slope floor in the back. I saw, it ex I saw the vantage point I, I'm standing at, looking at right now, and I did not know what city it was in. I didn't know, all I know is in a moment, I want you to hear this, in a moment, joy flood my soul. Now this is not the only solution, but it is a solution. I'm gonna talk about it in just a second. But man, when I had a new sense of purpose and vision, I was so fired up. Went and talked to my pastor and he says, it's God. God's, giving, God's leading you now to be a, a, a senior pastor of a church. Now, I didn't, know, I didn't know anything about being a senior pastor. In fact, I always said I would never be one. I wanted to be the best number two guy in the world. I did the music in the church. I was very, very happy doing um, what I did. And I said, well, what do you do next? He said, God's gonna give you supernatural love for a city. Just start looking for one. And so long story short, Tammy and I found... Uh, Birmingham, Alabama, going to the SEC baseball tournament. I mean, watching LSU play baseball. We were here in May of 2000, watching that uh, incredible uh, tournament. And um, I was at the summit, and I, and I love you guys know this story. I was standing up there at the summit at the Barnes & Noble getting a cup of coffee before I went to the Hoover Met. And I'm looking down at Highway 280. I mean, it's, it's traffic going in both directions, six lanes of traffic, and the Holy Spirit speaks to me as loud as I'm saying to you, you're gonna pastor the people down in that traffic jam. I drove up and down 280 for an hour and a half, on purpose. And uh, <laughs> I always tell people, I'm the only one who loves that traffic jam. And I was looking into people's eyes as we were at stopped at red lights. I'm like, oh, I'm gonna pastor you one day. I'm just, I didn't know anybody in town. I'm just, I'm having a vision, I'm having a moment with God, and I'm telling you, I can't explain to you the opposite of the depression and anxiety that left my life as I had a real sense of a purpose and vision for my life. The rest of the story, of course, is history. Look what the Lord has done. Nobody more amazed than me. I know who I am. I know who I am, and this is God. Come on, everybody. I said, this is God. <laughs> Fast forward to 2011. Our church is 10 years old. I just buried my dad, just buried Tammy's dad. I mean, I'm grieving and I led the funerals and I'm pretty tired and, and, and the church had been just kind of going at this crazy pace for 10 years. And I got invited to go to Australia with Pastor Mark Pettis to go speak at the Australian Christian Church's Pastors Conference, about three or 4,000 pastors. And so he and I flew over to Australia and when I landed uh, in Australia, I got off the plane, went straight to a Bible school, a seminary, and taught for half a day, got back on the plane in Sydney, um, flew up to Brisbane to speak to the Friday night service of a church there, spent the night, got back on the plane, flew from Brisbane down to Melbourne uh, to speak at the church that was the host of this pastor's conference, spoke the Saturday night services, Sunday morning services. And then we're now in the car headed to this retreat center to spend Sunday night, and my teachings would begin on Monday uh, at, uh, down there in the Victoria state of, of Australia. I'm telling you, the sun is setting. It is the, now the most peaceful moment I have had in the entire uh, trip so far. I'm relaxed. I've been preaching all day. I'm, I'm in the passenger seat uh, with the pastor. Of course, that's on this side. They drive on the wrong side of the road, so he's over here. <laughs> and uh, we're going through, I'll never forget, we're going through the outback. It was gorgeous. The sun was setting. We're getting ready to go have dinner, have a good night's sleep get to preach to some pastors again, when all of a sudden a 2,000 pound man sat on my chest. My left arm goes numb. I can't breathe and my heart rates, um, I would find out, was at about 180 beats per, uh, uh, per minute. And I'm screaming at the pastor saying, I'm dying, I'm dying, pull over, pull over. I'm dying and I can't breathe. I, I'm telling him my last words. I'm, tell, I'm actually told him what to tell Tammy. I really think I'm dying right now. And he calls the paramedic, we're out in the middle of nowhere. Brings me to this little bitty clinic out in the middle of the outback. Stay there for about 30 hours. 
while this pastor friend of mine, Shane, Pastor Shane, held my hand, never let go of my hand for 30 hours. Told me it's going to be all right. They couldn't find anything wrong with me. I mean, look at me, everybody. They could find nothing wrong with me. <laughs> and they said, we want to keep you for a week and do tests. I said, man, I got work to do. Let me go. And so um, we ended up, I went and, and preached, and I was still having these bouts of fast heart rate, all these same feelings, kind of worked through it. Um, man, I got to thank Mark Pettis, who actually just, I mean, cared for me like no other and got me home. Well, my cardiologist is in this church, and I, I was already texting him. I said, I said, Andy, man, you gotta, <laughs> I got to see you. He goes, listen to me. If we really want to know these stress tests, that's not going to work. We're going to need to get you to do a heart cath. I said, what is that? He says, we're going to go in through your leg, and we're going to go all the way up into your heart with a camera, and we're going to see what's going on. I said, all right, do it. And so I'll never forget kind of coming out of all, that, all, the, all, the, all the drugs that, that they put you out. And I'm sitting in this consultation room, and he walks in. He says, PC, got good news and bad news. I said, well, tell me that good news. He goes, your heart's perfect. He said, what's the bad news is? He goes, you, are, you, you have a pace that is going to destroy your life. He says, man, you got to slow down or you're going to die. Your body's trying to tell you something. And I said, really? I said, well, you give me the prescription, and I'll do it. And he did. Uh, I can say before God, and our elders know this, that he took, gave me a prescription of how I travel, how I Sabbath, how much time I spend, how many Sundays I speak, everything. And I have not broken it one time since 2011, and I've never had that type of uh, experience again since that time as well. I was having, yeah, I was having, how, I was having the, the, a panic attack. Fast forward now to 2018. 2018, two pastors in America who I'd never had met, not even one time, committed suicide. Young pastors in their 30s. When I'm in my home office, I'm reading these stories and I'm weeping like they were my best friends. I was, I, I, and I've done this long enough to know that the Lord was putting a burden on me. He wanted me to feel something for the benefit of other, other people. And I'm sobbing. I'm, I'm trying to find their widow's phone numbers so I can do whatever, I, I was gonna serve them any way I can. I'm, I'm sobbing like, like these were spiritual sons of mine. And I knew God was speaking to me. Well, we were in a series, it was September of 2018, and we were in a series just like the one we're in now. That year we called it Reply All. We were taking your questions and answering them. And one of the questions was about anxiety and depression. And so I spent that week, five days, studying. The, it was, I'm embarrassed to say, uh, that in the 18-year history of the church, I had never done a message on depression or anxiety. And I did five days worth of study, which was not nearly enough, brought a message to you guys that year, and it became the most rewatched message times 100. Brought it to a pastor's conference about two weeks later. My phone was ringing off the hook. You touched a nerve. You touched something I was dealing with. I did two years of research after that. I decided I'm going to study it, and if I'm good enough at it, I'd write a book about it. And I didn't want just the spiritual solution. I wanted to also know the practical. I, I talked to psychologists, psychiatrists, counselors, and I read at least, at least 20 books on depression and anxiety. I still don't know everything there is to know, but I know more than most. And I ended up writing a book. You guys know that. It released in, 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 in 2021. And I was in the middle of the manuscript, and the manuscript was due March of 2020. <laughs> Anybody remember that month? <laughs> By the way, it's just going to be 15 days to slow the spread, all right? And um, <laughs> and we were trying to figure out how to shut a church down, how to minister to you guys in all these crazy ways. We're setting up studios in my house increasing the fiber run into my house so we could, we didn't know how long we were going to be doing church, you know, we didn't, we didn't know. And, uh, and it was, of course, as disorienting as, as, as we all experienced. And then we also had this crazy election and we had the economy was freaking out and, of course, the racial uh, tensions that were taking place during that time. It was, it was a year, of course. And I called my publisher and says, no way, I'm not going to get it done. It's, 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 there's just no way. I need more time. They go, they went, oh, it's all right. We actually, um, if you turned it in in the fall, it'd be better for us anyway because May uh, is Mental Health Awareness Month. And instead of releasing it in January like we planned, we'll release it in May. That's even perfect. You have four more months. I found out later that that was God because I would go through that year, that summer especially, literally the darkest time of my entire life. 
Um, I had such a series of panic attacks. Um, it was just really hard, you know, and none of us knew what to do. We were all trying to do our best at everything. It was just crazy. It was crazy. And, um, and I won't go into the details. I was very, very um, honest about it, if you want to know the details, in chapter 3. I wrote the introduction of chapter 3 gives you all you need to know because um, it, was, it was just kind of crazy. You know, we had, we had threats on our life. We had all kind of cr- things happen. And um, so anyway, but I knew the Lord wanted me to experience it because I heard the Spirit of God say, all right, let's see if the book works. And I knew I was supposed to actually go through my own writing and test it before I ever released it. That I was supposed to see if this stuff actually works. And I remember saying, if this doesn't work for me, it can't work for anybody else. And I will never release it if it doesn't. And I remember coming out of all of that anxiety and fear and intimidation and pressure and panic and and I'm going to tell you, I got healed. I remember the moment when God healed me, and I had the confidence and the joy and the passion once again, and of course, uh, released the book in 2021 uh, called Out of the Cave. And I'm going to share with you just a few thoughts in it. I don't have time to give you the whole book, but I want to give you a few thoughts in it that I think are going to help you today. And here's one of the main things that I learned, and that is that anxiety is not a malfunction of your mind. It's trying to tell you something. If you're depressed today, you need to know your body's trying to tell you something. If you have anxiety, your body is trying to tell you something. If you're anxious or depressed, you're not weak and you're not crazy. You're a human being with unmet needs that God has for your life. And we certainly need to remove the stigma off of mental illness, anxiety, and depression. And I think the church needs to lead the way. I really do. I believe that with all my heart. And I'm taking the great risk. You have no idea how it feels to stand before you trying to be your leader and to tell you how weak I really was. And so I'm taking the risk to be vulnerable and honest and transparent in the hopes that it might help some of you. One of my greatest discoveries in my research, my two years of research, is I found about nine major causes of depression, seven of which had nothing to do with your body, actually. They weren't genetic or biological. They were actually what they call psychosocial. In other words, it either happened to you or you're doing it to yourself. So in other words, there are things you can change in your lifestyle or in your experiences to be healed from that will change it. And so, and of course, there are, there are two that are biological. They're, they are, they're, they're genetic. Tammy and I, our, our youngest of five children is autistic and he requires some medication. For years, we were looking for something to help Joseph. And, and you work so hard as a parent trying to find something. I'll never forget the day we found this one doctor. We kept changing doctors. We found this one doctor, and he said, look, try this. Um, and we were always cautious about any medications, but he said, try this. On day three, Joseph walks into my office and said, Dad, thank you so much. For the first time in my life, all the wires in my mind connect. And he got, and, and man, and he, he y'all don't, <laughs> yeah, praise God for that. And I've never told anybody this, I'm telling you now, but there were two years, the last two years of his high school years that every single day he walked in and told us, I can't live. So we can never leave him alone. We, we were, and now he's healthy and strong and he can stay on his own, and we're doing great now. Praise God for that. But I also know that, the, that, that biology and medication seems to dominate the conversation in this space. And if you allow biology to be the only solution in medication, you'll miss the real solutions. And I'll... Because seven out of the nine have things to do we can change in our lifestyles or we can heal from the things that have happened to us and I want to share those with you. Now, I don't have the time to give you all the things I learned and how anxiety and depression happens to us. You can get the book and read those if you want to hear my thoughts on that. But in 1 Kings chapter 18, we're going to go to 1 Kings chapter 19, is the story of Elijah, this great prophet who in chapter 18 defeats 850 prophets of Baal and Asherah. 
I mean, it's really one of the best preaching material in the whole Bible. And then he prays a prayer that ends a three and a half year drought. And then you jump into chapter 19, just one verse later. And it says, now Ahab, who's the king of Israel, told Jezebel, who's the queen of Israel, everything Elijah did when he killed all those prophets of Baal and Asherah, because those were their prophets, and they were pretty, pretty not happy about it. So Jezebel posted on Facebook to Elijah to say, <laughs> and I'm telling you, I'm being actually not funny, but like I'm being serious, because it was a comment on social media, their version of social media. And some of you need to hear that. May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow, I don't make your life like one of them. In other words, you killed them, I'm gonna kill you now. And this great prophet who could stand in the face of 850 prophets of Baal and Asher ran for his life. And when he came to Beersheba, remember that, I'll talk to you about it in about 15 minutes. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there, big mistake, I'm gonna deal with this all by myself. While he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. And I dedicate this message to anyone who prayed that prayer. I have had enough, Lord. Take my life. And then he throws in this random comment, I am no better than my ancestors. What does that have to do with anything? I talk about it in the book. But Elijah did at least six of the nine causes that I found in my research. And then I want to read to you the next portion of these verses because five things happened to him in the rest of the text of 1 Kings 19. When I wrote this book, these are not my opinions. I did bring in the research that I found, but then I just outlined 1 Kings 19. It's all I did. So the content of the book is not my thoughts. It's the six things that he did in the first few verses and the five things he did to get out of it in the, second, in the next few verses. And I always have two messages with this. So I have actually preached when I, when I do bring this to churches or conferences, it takes two messages. How you get in the cave of depression and anxiety, how do you get out? And I always have to choose. So one place I went, I actually did the six ways you get into anxiety and depression. And after I finished, this guy walked up, he says, Pastor Chris, that was so good. You got me in the cave, get me out of here. You know, like so. Uh, <laughs> so I'm gonna get you out of here today. Okay, here we go. Then he laid down under the, br the bush and he fell asleep. And all at once an angel shows up, it's the angel of the Lord, it actually is the Lord in angel form, it's what they call a theophany or a Christophany, and touched him and said, get up and eat. Notice that he didn't say worship, notice that he didn't say build an altar, notice that he didn't say repent, notice that he said, hey, first prescription, get up and eat. And he looked around, and there by his head was some bread, baked over hot coals and probably a slab of butter too. And he ate, drank, and he went back down for another nap. And the angel of the Lord came to it back a second time and he said, build an altar, sacrifice an animal, repent. No, hey, let's eat some more. For the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and strengthened by food, he was able to travel the next 40 days. So I just want to notice to you, note with you that the first prescription that God gave Elijah had nothing to do that was spiritual or even emotional, it was physical. He says, long before we ever take you on this spiritual journey and this emotional journey, we gotta get you healthy enough physically to take that journey. And it is prescription number one, that some of you are trying to fix something and you're too sick to fix it. You're like a surgeon with the flu. You can't help me now. You go get well, surgeon, then come cut on me. One researcher that I read, uh, that, I, that, that I learned so much from, he said, we need to talk less about chemical imbalances and more about the imbalances in the way we live our lives. Another one said this, we were never designed for the way we live, we're living our lives. Sedentary, indoor, socially isolated, fast food laden, sleep deprived, frenzied pace of modern life. For many of us, your first prescription, I'm, try, I'm so excited to give you, is that you need to find a different pace I call it the pace of grace. The pace of grace is not what you're able to do. It's what you can do and stay sane. And for many of us, would you look at me for a minute here? You're doing too much. You're trying to fit way too much in your life. You're, you're living that American dream that if one is good, two is better. If one if, if, if one house is good, two is better. If one dollar is good, two is better. If one car is good, come on, help me out. 
Two is better. If one wife is good, two is wrong. Don't do you that. Don't, don't go there. The Bible says it's better. Everybody say better. Better, better to have one handful and have what you're all looking for, tranquility, than to have two handfuls and to have toil and a chasing after the wind. So the truth is, and I'm just trying to bring you prescription number one from the angel of the Lord himself. You ought to lay down and eat something. You ought to come to church and now go home and not mow grass and maybe get some work done to get the, the week started off right. No, 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 no. You ought to go, I call it, you ought to go, go and get in front of the TV, turn a golf tournament on and not watch it. Trust me, when you, when you wake up, they'll still be doing the same thing, all right? You, you won't have missed a thing. And then you ought to ask, tell your wife, hey, honey, let's, let's go take a walk through the neighborhood. And then after she passes out, pick her back up and grab her hand and like hold hands. And maybe come back in and have some Rice Krispie treats. Come on, some, are y'all listening to me? And just sit and visit and talk about your week and... Maybe go to bed a little early and watch how much more emotional energy you can bring into a new week if you're not living a two-handful kind of a life. The wisdom of life consists of the elimination of the non-essentials. You know what that means? Don't just make a to-do list. You ought to make a not-to-do list. No, I can do it, but I don't think it'd be good for me. Yes, we could, we, could, we could play that sport. We could do that thing, but we can't do that many at a time. So sorry, we have to say no. And if you say no... You'll trade popularity for respect. No, I just can't do that. So sorry. So sorry. Look at the second thing that happened. Then he went into the cave and spent the night. And now the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? Now watch this. It's very interesting. He said, I've been very zealous. Like I'm one of your best guys. I, I left it all out on the field in chapter 18. And the Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, put your prophets to death with the sword, and I'm the only one left. Now, that wasn't true. He was already told at the beginning of chapter 18 that there were hundreds of other prophets. So he's lying to himself. We'll get back to that in a second. Then the Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord. This is prescription number two. For the Lord is about to pass by, and a great and powerful wind tore through the mountains and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord wasn't in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And then there was a fire, but the Lord wasn't in the fire. Earth, wind, and fire. Ha, there it is right there. <laughs> they thought they made it up. They didn't. But after the fire came a gentle whisper, and the Lord was in the whisper. Like there's, there's something about experiencing the manifest presence of Almighty God. Listen to me, church. It's probably one of the greatest prescriptions and medications for anxiety and depression that exists. I'm not kidding. And that's why every one of us have to learn how to cultivate the whispers of God, the presence of God for ourselves. Now, my prayer is you experience it today. When you're in this room worshiping, I hope there was this sense of, oh, oh, thank you, Jesus. But then there's six more days without it. And that's why we have to learn how to enter the sanctuary of God on our own. Go read um, Psalm 73, the whole thing. I don't have time to show you the whole thing. But it's written not by King David. It's written by a guy named Asaph, who was basically the C.J. Blunt uh, for King David. He was, he was, he's the chief musician. And he's like having a bad hair day, real bad. And the first uh, 15 verses, he's complaining like crazy. It's all negative. The whole thing's negative. And he's, he's talking about how bad life is. He's talking about... And the, e the evil have it good, and the, and the godly people have it bad, which is just not fair. He says, and when I tried to understand it, it made me even more depressed until I entered the sanctuary. And then the rest of it goes, and now I understand how God's, and it's just, he, he knew how to take his anxiety and depression and find that place where God is. And I just sure hope you have that in your arsenal. And if you don't, you are missing one of the easiest, quickest, most powerful tools 
for depression and anxiety, and that is just the presence of God. OPC, how do I do it? If you just turn to him in prayer and worship at any point in the day, he'll come and answer your prayers. Listen to me. But you ready for this? It's even better if you do it first part of the day. Now, he'll do it all day long, but it's not all's well that ends well. It's all's well that begins well. Like if you'll learn how to start your day, I'm asking you to try this for one week. Every depressed, anxious person in the room, fear and intimidation, do one thing it's a, as a test case. And it's set your clock 15 minutes earlier than you currently are. Get up, put on the, some great worship, and just talk to God. In fact, I call it the first 15. Five minutes in the Word, five minutes in worship, five minutes in prayer. And all your app that we have will facilitate every bit of this. You can go and we'll give you one year Bible. Like you could spend time with God and I promise you, it'll calm the savage beast on the inside of you. Yeah, that's good. You gotta learn how to cultivate the presence of God. Anybody in this room who has ever experienced that, say a good amen. amen. There you go, there's your testimonies, okay. Yeah. Third thing. And when Elijah heard that gentle whisper, he pulled his cloak over his face. Your face represents what you believe about yourself, your identity. And he went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. And then a voice said to him, same question. What are you doing here, Elijah? And watch what he answers this time. I've been very zealous for the Lord. I've left it all in the field. I'm one of your best guys. In fact, the Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. <laughs> he repeats the lie for the second time. Listen to me. For a lot of you, the reason why you're anxious, have anxiety, depression, is you have talked yourself into a lie about you that's not true. And you've rehearsed it, and you're even good at, you're even good at saying it. You say, where does it come from? Well, it comes in two places. First, it comes from things people are saying to you about you. And for a lot of you, it's coming on social media. Okay, listen to me. Some of you have been convicted about what you look at online and on social media, and I was supposed to say in this moment as a con confirmation for you to actually do it, it's time to get off. Amen. You gotta stop listening to the voice of the haters, everybody. You gotta stop, you gotta stop it. Now, I enjoy just as much as anybody, or I used to, but I just, <laughs> and it just, it shocks me that nobody, there, there are actually people who don't like me. I can't, for the reason, I can't fathom. I honestly, I just like, what did I do? I'm always like, I don't understand. I really don't understand. It's just like, it was kind of frustrating to me. And it just got to a point where I just, I just couldn't listen to it anymore. And I have other people who watch it for me. I just, I cannot pollute my mind with what haters think about. I just can't, do, I, I can't do it. I am sanguine enough. Where it actually bothers me. And I believe it like, did I? I, I, I I'm, that's what I am. That's what I do. <laughs> oh, no. Like, and some of you need to stop too. That's good. That's good. That's good. Now when people say, did you hear? Like, no, didn't hear that. <laughs> and, and honestly, don't finish that sentence. I don't need to hear it. And some of you need to be careful. about. I call it selective ignorance. Yeah. That's good. You got to select what you're ignorant about. Yeah. You want some peace in your life? That was worth uh, coming to church today right there, everybody, okay? Okay. But not only, watch this, not only what the world and the others say about you, but it's what you're telling yourself. Sociologists, psychologists call it rumination. Rumination is the focused attention on the symptoms of your very real distress, but you're gonna ruminate it. You're gonna chew on it, swallow it, chew it some more. That's what a ruminating animal does. They chew the cud, right? Chew, get some grass. That's what, come on, y'all country folk. Get some grass, chew it. The jaw always goes sideways a little bit. They swallow it, these cows do. They throw it back up in their mouth, chew it some more, swallow it. Throw it back up in their mouth, chew it some more, swallow it. That's why a cow cannot put his face on the ground for four hours and he's still chewing something. Why? He's ruminating. And how many of you know every time that grass comes back up, it ain't coming up back better it's coming back up grosser. And so do your thoughts. Sitting on the couch, ruminating. Somebody sent me this. <laughs> One of our pastors sent me this. It's, the, it's, it's funny and sad at the same time. It's called the anti-Psalm 23. 
I am on my own. No one looks out for me or protects me. I experience a continual sense of need, nothing quite right. I'm always restless. I'm easily frustrated and often disappointed. It's a jungle. I feel overwhelmed. It's a desert. I'm thirsty. My soul feels broken, twisted, and stuck, and I can't fix myself. I stumble down some dark path. Still, I insist. I want to do what I want, when I want, how I want, but life's confusing. Why don't things ever really work out? I'm haunted by the emptiness and futility, shadows of death. I fear the big hurt and final loss. I spend my life protecting myself. Bad things can happen. I find no lasting comfort. I'm alone facing everything that could hurt me. Are my friends really my friends? I can't really trust anyone. No one has my back. No one's for me except me. My my cup is never quite full enough. I'm left empty. Surely disappointment follows me all the days of my life. And I will forever be free falling into void. And for some of you, this is the narrative you tell yourself. Tell yourself. Tell yourself. Tell yourself. One of the researchers that I study is called Brian Tracy, and he said 95% of your emotions are determined by the way you talk to yourself. So what do we do? We've got to let the narrative I believe about myself come from the only source of truth that exists on planet Earth, and that's God's Word. And that's why if you'll get on the app today, I'm going to give you seven phrases and seven scriptures that I want you to read over yourself in your prayer time. Things like, God wants me to give him my anxiety. God is with me. God is fighting for me. Anxiety doesn't get to win. God is greater than my anxiety. There will be peace in my life and there will be victory. I'm gonna give you this as a tool today. Number four, I'm behind, but I'm gonna keep preaching. It's okay. I'll let you out on time. You'll be all, y'all get anything out of this so far? Okay, all right. And then the Lord said, go back the way you came. Remember I told you to remember the word Beersheba? Because that's the way he came. So basically he said, go back through Beersheba. Beersheba, the name of Beersheba is called the place of the oath. Beersheba is the place he said he'd serve God. And he says, I need you to go back to the place you said you'd serve God. I need you to re-up. And then I need you to get back to work and anoint this guy and anoint that guy, and anoint, in other words, I need you to get back in the game, dude. I need you to get back and doing what I've called you to do. He says, and the whole lies about you're all by yourself, no, there's 7,000 more. You're all right, bro. And what was God doing? He's doing what every one of in this room needs. This is what happened in my first story, what got me to Birmingham. And that is we need to find, or for some of you, renew your God-given sense of purpose. So I'm going to tell you something. You're never coming out of your anxiety if you keep making it all about you. The moment you start thinking about the needs of somebody else. Viktor Frankl, I love studying his works. Life is never made of unbearable circumstances, never. But only by lack of meaning and purpose. And that's why I'd love for you to get back in the game, going after God. This was Paul's secret. I don't have time to read it all, but he said, I have bad days every day. I'm so stinking depressed and anxious. He he was talking about it. But he says, but I don't lose heart. I'm actually in the middle of my anxiety. I'm being renewed. Why, Paul? Because these light momentary troubles are achieving for me a glory that outweighs them. And I don't have my eyes fixed on Instagram and Facebook and the politics and the economy. I had my eyes fixed on unseen things. That's his purpose. That's what God was calling him to do. So in 2020, at the height of it all, <laughs> I'm reading my stuff. This was already in the book. Got in my car. Went back to that same place at that cafe on at the Barnes and Noble. And I'm telling you, I lifted my hands, I was saying, God, I'm re up, and I told you I'd serve you no matter what. And no matter what happened, and um, 
and I'm re-upping, I'm going after you. And I felt that whole sense of purpose. Vision started flooding my heart. I was starting dreaming of how do you pull a church out of a pandemic and how do we rebuild people's lives? And it all came back again, just like it did the first day because I had a renewed sense of purpose in my life. Are y'all listening to me, everybody? You gotta do the same. Last one. So then Elijah went from there and found what he should have done in the first place, a godly friend, Elisha, son of Shaphat, who was plowing his oxen. And he went up to him and he threw his cloak on him. Now, in the, in the Old Testament, a cloak, you put in your robe on somebody else says, I'm a covenant friend. I'm, I'm going to be in covenant relationship with you. And some of you, you're not, if you did all four of these prescriptions and you leave out this one, it may still not work that you were never meant to walk through this alone. Remember, he left his servant there. And some of you are battling your anxiety and your depression all on your own. I can handle this, I'm tough. I'm a, I'm a country boy from Alabama. No, no, sir. You need a friend, you need an Elisha. Uh, in my studies, I found out your IQ drops 30 points if you're isolated. Which is why the fifth prescription I leave you with today is you got to maintain your life with godly relationships. Can't live my life alone. Can't do it. So here's the book. Um, and y'all know here at Highlands, um, uh, if you want this book, if we have, a, if we have any here, um, we, I, never, I never make a dollar from, the, and I'll sell them to everybody else, but I don't make a dollar from, from y'all. I've always get, made every resource I've ever written at cost. I don't make a penny from anything that I've, that I've written, because you're my church family. The, the, we, we were part of this together, so if you want this and it's out there, you grab it. And if you don't have the money, take it. I will pay for it. I don't, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to sell books. I'm trying to help you. Help you. Now, the rest of the world can buy one. Um, so. <laughs> not you, but the rest of them can. Um, but... Um, Tim, you remember the story? Um, I was really at the end, my wit's end one day, and I was, I was having a real bad day. And I walked out of a basement level of our house to the backyard, and from the lower level of our house, rounded the corner, my best friend, Rick Bizet. The pastor's in Arkansas. He just shows up. I said, bro, what are you doing here? Because I ain't leaving until you, until you get right. And, uh, and him and Dino and Lee and I should never start naming names. There was my pastor, Larry, everybody. You know, they we were all apart. But I decided to dedicate the book to Rick. And there's a message in it for you. And I'll close with this. This book is dedicated to Rick Bizet. For more than 25, now 28 years, you've been a faithful and trusted friend. Our constant conversations always encourage me. Your positive spirit always lifts me. You are a gift to me from God. My prayer is that everyone could have a friend like you to help them out of the cave. If you're at Highlands and you're in any of the conditions I described today, you are welcome here. We don't judge you. We want to walk with you because we've all been through the same thing. Welcome home. Welcome home. Amen, everybody. Let's bow. let's bow for prayer. Oh, I'm exhausted. All right, let's bow for prayer. <laughs> so, Father, open your hands. Father, I pray for every person here that you just give them the sense of peace that you promised to be people of God, the rest that you always promised. God, give them the courage to take some of the steps that I've offered today as a solution. And God, heal broken hearts, tired, weary, anxious, depressed, intimidated, fearful, worried. God, I rebuke it in the mighty name of Jesus. Heal, I pray, God. Heal, I pray. Help them out of the cave, Lord, and then help them be someone who helps others out of that cave. If you could put your hands down, keep your heads bowed, your eyes closed. If you're here today and you're away from God, you need to make Jesus the Lord of your life. 
Honestly, I don't have any solutions if you can't let me give you the, re- the main solution. And that is a relationship with a living God who is powerful. And if you need Jesus in your life, I'm going to pray a simple prayer. And you can pray it with me. And if you believe it, you can be born again and a new creation and on your way to a brand new life. And then at the end of the service, if you need prayer, we'll have prayer teams. They were, they, it was packed in the first service. You could come and join us. We'd love to pray with you and stand with you. But if you're far from God and you need Jesus in your life or if you need to rededicate your life to him, say this right now and mean it. Say, Jesus, I need you. Forgive me for going my own way. Today I turn to you and I repent. Make it personal. Say, be the Lord of my life. Number one in my life. I give you my life, everything. Now make this bold confession. Say, I believe you're the son of God. And I believe you rose from the dead. And today I put my faith, my trust, and my life in you. In your name I pray. Amen. And amen. Put your hands together for everybody who just prayed that prayer. That's amazing. What a great message. And I want to say to those of you who maybe you just prayed that prayer and you took the greatest step of your life, our greatest desire is to walk this journey out with you. That's why we exist as a church. We don't exist to have services each Sunday. We exist to walk this journey of life with you. And the most important thing you can do now is to let us know that you made that decision. One of three ways, real simple. The connection card I mentioned earlier, you can let us know right in the middle of that card. There's some in the seat backs if you don't have one. Also, if you're in the app, digital connection card, just check the box that says, hey, I made a decision today. Or you could text the word commit to 74,000. Any of those three ways are going to let us know. So we can give you some next steps. Now, I want to encourage you If you just made that decision, I want to put some resources in your hands today. And if you'll go out in the lobby, right out there, you'll see the information area. Our team is out there to pray for you. Our team is out there. You can take your connection card with you and give them that card. They're going to give you two things. They're going to give you a book that Pastor Chris wrote called What's Next. And it kind of outlines your relationship with God and what it can look like, along with a letter from Highlands that just says, here's what you can do at Church of the Highlands if you want to grow, if you want to take some next steps. We're going to put that in your hands today. If you let us know digitally in one of those two ways, just let the team know. Say, hey, I... I was in in the app and I let the the digital connection card know that I made a decision. And we're gonna put in your hands today resources that are going to help you. You need to take next steps, we all do. You heard Pastor Chris talk about multiple next steps today. Step one of the growth track next Sunday, 6 p.m. If you haven't done it, I want you to join us there. It's an important step. Water baptism next Sunday, join us, be part of that. Take some steps and grow in your relationship with God. If you need to get in a small group, our team is in the lobby, yellow lanyard zone. You'll see them, find a place to get connected in relationship. It is vital, especially if you're new here and you don't know anybody and you're you're not really that connected. Get in a small group. It's really, really, really important. We have our one college booth out in the lobby as well. College students, if you need a place to connect, get involved, meet some people, go to the one booth. Our team would love to meet with you out there and connect with you today. All right, really important. And then as Pastor Chris mentioned, we are going to have our prayer team come out during this last song. So if you need somebody to pray with you one-on-one, I understand today's message could stir some things up in your heart and you just have the need of somebody to join in agreement with you. Our team is going to be down here during this last song. So I want you to stand up with me. Ushers, go ahead and come down to the front. If you came prepared to worship with your giving today and you want to do that in the service, you can do that in the bucket. You can see there on the screen digital ways as well. But I'm going to pray. And as soon as we finish praying, if you need prayer, you come on down to the front. Father, we love you today. And we're so grateful for the message that Pastor Chris brought to us. Lord, we declare that there is no one like you. And as we worship with our giving, I'm asking you to bless it in a mighty way. I'm asking you to move in people's lives and their hearts. Lord, right now, we declare the name of Jesus, the greatest name that will ever come out of our mouth over every situation. We worship you now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.